and welcome to our ALG web event today. Um, this is the, uh, I think, the fifth one of our adaptive and authoring software series, and this is in support of our textbook transformation grants, the new category of interactive course authoring tools and software. Uh, these will be archived and available on our site, and uh, I will be putting that up on our event site uh, as soon as that is ready, and I will uh, send you the link to that. There it is. So there is our training and development page. Um, this will be archived there if you would like to share it with colleagues. Uh, be sure to mute your microphone if you are not speaking so that ambient noise gets removed. Uh, and also, please change your send to to all panelists so that everybody gets your question and not just me. If you do have a technical question, just send it to me and then I can uh, work out the WebEx stuff. And with that, I am really happy to have both Brady Cobb and Chris Scaff uh, from Skypack to present on their application today, their software. Um, so thank you very much and take it away. All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, this is Brady Kalb. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer here at Skypack, and uh, Chris Scaff is also on the conference with me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead here and share my, my screen so you can see, uh, see the slides. Um, please let me know uh, if for some reason that uh, stops or, or uh, starts tracking slowly or something like that. Um, feel free to jump in and, and let me know. We can make sure that's, that's sorted out. Uh, yeah, so I very much appreciate it. very much appreciate the opportunity uh, here to tell you guys a little bit about what we do at Skypack. Uh, so primarily, uh, we are involved in in two things. The first is instructional design and content curation, acting as a partner to the the schools and the professors that we work with uh, to help them uh, work on their courses. Uh, and secondly, we also have a content delivery tool that works across multiple platforms so students can access all of their course content on, on the web and on their mobile devices as well. And as we go through these slides, I'll talk in detail about both of these two things uh, and how it can potentially align with uh, what you folks are doing down, down at Georgia. <clears throat> Uh, so the first thing uh, that we do is work with schools and faculty members to help them simplify the transition uh, away from a, a high-priced traditional textbook to more fairly priced materials for their students. Uh, and this oftentimes involves many different things. Uh, we have instructional designers that are on our team for every project that we work with. We will pair a instructional designer on our team with the department or the faculty member or group of faculty members uh, that are involved in that project, and, and they will act as a consultant uh, throughout that entire project, uh, even beyond uh, the launch uh, of that class. Um, and in terms of what we do uh, when we're working through a, a course project with a faculty member, uh, one of the first things that we'll do is, is look, help, help find and source uh, open source OER content for that class and then map that content to the curriculum that is already being taught in the class. Uh, so unless there is a specific change that the professor or professors want to make, uh, we will map the content that we source uh, to the existing curriculum. Uh, and, and if there are changes that they, the professor wants to make, we're happy to incorporate uh, those as well. Uh, but that current curriculum is, is usually the starting point uh, when we go out and find uh, content for that class. Uh, we also, beyond uh, just looking at OER content, we also do custom content development. Uh, and this can mean a number of things. Uh, we have a full studio production facility at one of our offices, so we can create uh, very dynamic and engaging videos. Uh, we also have a mobile studio. We can go on location and, and do filming there. Uh, and then, of course, graphic designers and things like that that can build uh, build uh, artwork and, and, and graphs and things for a course if, if needed. Um, if the instructor is 
uh, creating any of the content on their own, uh, and that's entirely up to them whether or not they want to. Uh, we can assist in, with things like copy editing and facilitating a peer review process for that faculty authored content. Um, beyond you know, custom content that, that we create, OER content and faculty authored content, when needed, we can also go out to third parties and license content for inclusion in the course. Uh, so examples of this may be videos or uh, sec sections of a book or something like that. Um, there isn't always uh, op good open source content for every topic in every course. Uh, so in those cases, we'll go out and find uh, a, a third party that we can license content from and blend all of those things together. Uh, we can also handle accessibility review uh, and compliance on the content. Uh, and what we do there is, is look at the, both the guidelines of the ADA and uh, and the specific school that we're working with, uh, and, and then evaluate uh, any of the content, be that open content or faculty authored content, uh, and make sure that, that those pieces of content are in compliance with those guidelines and standards. Uh, after uh, the course is launched, uh, so after we've gone through the process with the faculty member of putting together and curating all of the course content, uh, and that course is launch, launched, our involvement continues. So we will work with that professor uh, throughout the semester and after the semester is over between semesters to make any revisions that they might want to make. Uh, a lot of times what we'll see is instructors uh, during the course of the semester, a, a news event or something will, will occur and they want to include that and talk about that in their course. Uh, so we'll work with them on, on a day-to-day -day basis to inject content that they want to talk about in their course, given what's taking, taking place in, in the world and things like that. Uh, it's also uh, important to note that when we're working with faculty members who are creating their own content, uh, we do not take any ownership rights to that content. So uh, our policy there is that the, the ownership of content rests with the original creator. Uh, if it's open content, then of course it's, it's open, it's Creative Commons license or something like that. Uh, but in terms of faculty authored content, we leave it up to the faculty member to do uh, what they want with that, with that content. So they can, they can assign a Creative Commons license to it, for example, if they want to do that. Uh, we don't stand in the way uh, of that at all. Um, so all of, the, all of the things that we do when we're working with a professor to build a, a course package, a uh, set of content for the course, is really driven by the, the mantra that's down here at the very bottom of this slide. And, and that's that, that we believe that faculty should teach what and how they want to. Um, so really what that means is the, the faculty member is in the driver's seat throughout this process. Uh, when we're building a course, we're not going to force any content on them. If there's something that they don't want to use or that they don't like or they absolutely want to use, we're going to go based on their recommendations. Uh, we're also not going to unilaterally change content on them. So we won't come back semester or two later and say we've now switched module one with module three uh, and you need to revise your course based on that. Uh, once the course is, is where they want it to go, we'll simply make, uh, make revisions uh, based on what they, what they want to do. Uh, so they stay in the driver's seat throughout that entire process. Before I move on to the, the next slide, are there, are there any questions? Please, please feel free to jump in with, with questions at any time. All right, great. So I wanted to talk on the next slide uh, a little bit about uh, our, our process. Uh, so I mentioned before that uh, every course we worked with, that professor or group of professors is paired with an instructional designer on our team. Uh, so this is a, a scaled back high level uh, outline of the way uh, a project uh, works when, when working with Skypack. Uh, so at the very beginning, we'll, we'll work with the professor to first understand the, the course objectives, what are the learning outcomes of that course, uh, what are the materials that are currently being used, and, and oftentimes that's a, a traditionally published uh, textbook from one of the major publishers. 
Uh, we'll also look at the, the syllabus and, and course calendar to get a feel for the, the flow of the class and what what is important uh, what is important for the instructor that, that are, are the key takeaways for the students from that class. Uh, and then also a look at the assessment strategy uh, and of course the student population. Uh, as you know, student needs uh, vary widely across uh, different campuses. So we definitely want to take the unique uh, needs of the specific student population into account as we're as we're working with the faculty member to develop a, a new set of course materials. Um, once that initial review phase is done, we move into the development phase. Um, so we can have conversations there with the faculty member around pedagogy and, and format of the class. Uh, again, if they're not wanting to make any changes, and that's not something that we would we would make any changes to. Uh, but if they want to do some pedagogy or methodology changes, such as flipping the classroom, then we're more than happy to assist with that. Uh, also, if they're wanting to transition from face-to-face uh, -face class format to uh, fully online or a blended format, uh, then we can we can help uh, develop the class and in that way as well. Uh, from that point, we'll we'll do that content sourcing phase. So we will then go out and identify and source uh, the content. Uh, from those different sources, OER, uh, custom-built content, content that faculty member creates, and, and third-party licensed content if need be, uh, and then map all that content back to the curriculum uh, as, we did, as we went through in that first phase of the project. Uh, from that, then we'll turn around uh, a set of course materials that the instructor can then review. Uh, and oftentimes, this is an iterative process. Um, so, you know, we don't disappear off into the woods for three months and bring back an entire course of, of full of content. Uh, it'll be very, very um, um, iterative. Uh, so we'll go out and find uh, the first week or, or first or second modules of content, bring that back to the faculty, uh, so they can be they can be advising it and facilitating that process throughout the entire uh, process of developing that course. Uh, after that development process is is completed, um, the class then launches in the next in the next semester. And then, as I mentioned before, we're in that process of as far as the professor wants to of continuously revising and and continually improving that course. Uh, so a lot of times, what we find is after the first semester, uh, the professor learns uh, from the students what works well, what doesn't work well. Uh, so we can we can take things out, we can add new things. Um, they'll have ideas for for new new uh, introductory videos to the beginning of modules, things like that. So we can continually uh, revise and improve that course uh, as much as the instructor wants to do. Um, uh, here, I also wanted to note that you know every project that we work on is very unique. Uh, so there is no real standardized. Uh, pricing for uh, for the students or for for the institution. Uh, in most cases, you know, our our goal is really to get the price down uh, as much as we can for the students, given all the work that needs to be done. And that's going to differ based on the professor's needs and what they what they want to deliver to the students. Uh, on average, that's around twenty five dollars uh, price point for the students. Uh, some examples here on on the next slide of some of the different types of custom content that we can we can create beyond uh, images and things like that. Uh, very interactive and, and dynamic presentations uh, using tools like Adobe Captivate or or Microsoft Office Mix. If you're familiar with those two, uh, we also do a lot of video work um, both in in our studio in College Station, Texas. Uh, and also on location, so we have a mobile video studio that we can bring uh, to a campus and work with a professor there for a day or two to get the, the videos created that they need for the course. Um, we can also work with uh, videos that instructors have already generated or want to create themselves. Uh, so we have faculty who will, will simply use a webcam to create short three to five minute introductory uh, videos for each, each week of the class. Uh, we can work with those, do the, the editing, the processing, the, the closed captioning uh, for all of those videos. Uh, and if, if there's a desire and a need, we can also provide voice and acting talent for, for any of those videos. Um, beyond that, we also can, can, can help with the, what, what would be considered the traditional publishing services, so copy editing, peer review, 
uh, helping to create assessments for for the class, uh, things things like that. On the course delivery side, um, so we have a, a delivery platform uh, that you can access on the SkyPack website uh, and also on uh, your mobile devices. Uh, uh, all the content is, is available through, um, through iTunes, Google Play, or the Amazon uh, App Store. Um, so from the student's perspective, what this really means is anytime, anywhere access, it's a cloud-hosted system, so anything that they will do uh, on one platform will translate over to their other platforms. So, for example, if they're at home studying, working in their course on their laptop, and they're, they're highlighting content and making bookmarks and taking notes, uh, when they get on the bus the next day to, to, go, to, uh, to go to campus, they're going to have access to all, that, all, all those, those bookmarks and highlights of things that they did on their, on their laptop. Uh, the interface is very, very easy for, for students and faculty to, to use. Um, we can also uh, embed uh, different types of learning activities, um, much like you see in learning management systems. Um, so we can put uh, self-assessment questions in directly in line with the content. So an example here is uh, potentially having students watch a video, read a few paragraphs of test, text, and then answer a self-assessment question uh, that gives them immediate feedback on whether or not they, they comprehended the information that they were supposed to get out of that, that video and text. We can also do graded quizzes and exams, uh, give students access to discussion boards, either graded or not graded, and allow students to submit their homework through the platform uh, and, and give the professor uh, or teaching assistants a way to grade and give feedback on that homework. Uh, the platform itself will also integrate uh, with the, the learning management system um, through, uh, through uh, LTI learning uh, tool interoperability. Um, and, and this can mean a number of things based on what the instructor wants it to do. It can be as simple as a single sign-on uh, to Skypack from, from the learning management system. Uh, it can also mean passing uh, great information back and forth. Uh, and then also as students are interacting with their course content, we're also collecting analytical data on, on their engagement. Um, and I have a slide coming up that shows a little bit more detail uh, about, uh, about the analytics. Um, so this is a, a pretty high level list of all the different things that, that the platform is capable of. Um, certainly not every professor uh, makes use of all of these. You can really think of it as a buffet line. Um, professors use only what makes sense for their, uh, their own course. Um, so we have some professors that, that use uh, the, the quizzing and discussion boards uh, within, within Skypack and some who have always used their, their Blackboard or Canvas uh, systems and, and want to continue doing that, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, so we'll work with them to set the course up the way they want to, using the tools and, and systems that they want to. Uh, from a, a course delivery perspective, uh, the way that this works is, is everything is permission-based. So uh, in order for a student to have access to the course environment, so they need to be on that course roster. Uh, every school that we work with has their own environment within our system, that what we call a channel. Uh, and that, again, is permission-based, so only students in registered courses on the platform will have access to that school's environment. Uh, once they're in that environment, they will be able to see, based on their permission levels, the different courses that they are in that they have access to. Uh, and this is where they go to get that content the first time. Uh, once, they've, once they've done that the first time, then it will show up uh, immediately on their dashboard when they log in, either through the web-based platform or through their uh, mobile application. Some examples of, of how content uh, looks on the platform. On the, on the left here is an example of what I was talking about earlier, that inline self-assessment. So in this case, uh, students are, are reading, uh, reading some, some text uh, for, for the, the week uh, and then are asked to complete a number of self-assessment questions. Uh, these give them immediate feedback on whether they're incorrect or, or correct. There can also be um, feedback, text-based feedback generated, so if, if you want to point students back to a specific location in the text, uh, that can be added as a prompt if they get the question wrong. 
the middle picture there is showing an inline video with the text. So here students are reading some text and then are, are asked to watch a video. Um, and, and on the right side, a, a screenshot of the way that the table of contents uh, uh, looks. Uh, and at the top there, you can see the different tabs for bookmarks and highlights. Uh, if there's uh, any gradable items within the course, they have a link to their gradebook uh, uh, as well. Uh, so students can navigate through their course uh, this way, jumping around to where they, where they need to go. Um, all of this content can be released immediately at the beginning of the semester or follow an adaptive release format. Um, and that can be based on a number of things. Uh, most commonly is, is by date. Uh, so additional modules are opened up as, uh, as the, the, the date um, is, is reached, uh, but it can also be released on activities as well. So if there's uh, content that you do not want to have released until a, a student completes a, a exam or a quiz, for example, then those can be conditionally released uh, upon those activities uh, also. A couple other examples here are a screenshot of how a discussion board looks. Uh, so this is a, a, a single-threaded discussion board. Um, in this case, a professor is asking, uh, asking students to uh, respond to a question prompt, and then they can, can uh, also respond to other students' responses to that question prompt. Um, there is the ability to upload videos, so we have some faculty who ask ask students to make a, make a short video just using their cell phone or, or webcam or something like that uh, and upload that video to the discussion board, board to, to have a, a video diary more than just a text-based uh, discussion board. Uh, as I mentioned, we can also accept homework submissions through the, through the system. Uh, and on the right of the screen here is an example of, of how that works. The students simply uh, drop a file. Uh, from a folder onto the screen, uh, or they can click on, on the, the box and, and browse to the file they want to upload. This next slide here shows um, our approach to uh, analytics. Uh, so as students are moving through the course and taking part in the activities, we're, we're tracking, tracking that. Um, so what you're looking at here is uh, on the left, that left column is a list of every item, every element, or every page uh, that is in this course environment. Uh, and then the number of access uh, times, or what we call views, seeing your view per element, uh, it's broken down by web accesses, access on, on Apple mobile devices and Android mobile devices. Um, so you can see this class is very heavily web-based. Um, it's, it's an online, fully online class, so most of them are going to be sitting in front of a computer when they're doing this, um, not, you know, not taking part in the class fully on a, on a mobile device. Um, so what instructors can see here, this is an aggregate view. So this is of all the number of views uh, on these elements by the entire class. Uh, if you look up here in the top left corner, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse cursor here, uh, but there's a little link that says view data by user. So an instructor can go in and see what a specific student is, is doing. Um, and, and what a lot of people use this for is, you know, a student does poorly on an exam. Uh, they want to know, the professor wants to know why. Uh, this is a place they can come and quickly check, okay, if the exam covered modules, you know, six through nine, uh, the professor can go in and look and see, well, this student didn't even look at the content from module six through nine, so that's a pretty good indication of, of maybe why they did poorly uh, on the exam. Um, so you can look at that aggregate data uh, and, and also uh, on that um, uh, per, per user or per student data as well. Uh, aside from the number of times content is viewed, uh, we're also uh, providing information to the professor on how much, how much time students are spending on each of those elements. Uh, so if I were to scroll down from where the screenshot is, you can see average time spent per element. That's the next, uh, the next section uh, below this views. Uh, and again, that can be looked at by, uh, by individual students or on an aggregate level. Um, we always caution people when we're talking about this, that this is a guide. Um, when a student opens up a page in their course, you know, we can tell that that page is open uh, we can't tell if they open that page and then go then go eat some pizza. 
Um, so it really is a, a, a guide. It's not uh, it's not 100 percent you know guaranteed that the student is actually engaged with that that content at the time. Um, we don't do eye tracking or anything like that. Uh, all of this information is exportable to Excel, so you can see that green export Excel button, uh, and, and you can export this into Excel and then do computations in there, or you can import from there into whatever your favorite statistical package uh, is that you like to work with. I wanted to uh, walk through here an, an example project that uh, that we we just launched uh, with a with a school uh, on Monday. So Monday was the first day of classes. Uh, this is Biology 1725 at St. Paul College Introduction to Environmental Science. Uh, so prior to working with 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 Skypack, they were there, there was two instructors. They were using uh, the, this textbook uh, by Cunningham and Cunningham, Principles of Environmental Science. The newest edition is 2016. Uh, the last edition was 2014, so there's only been two years uh, since those, those, those two editions. Uh, the new price uh, of this book is $207. Uh, the used price of this book is $153. There aren't a whole lot of used copies out there since this is a 2016 book. Um, so most students are going to be forced into purchasing that new version of the book. Uh, we started this project with them in, in the spring of 2016. I believe it was around uh, the April, late April, early May timeframe. Uh, and we launched this course, as I mentioned, uh, on, on Monday, two days ago. Uh, this course uses uh, all four of those different uh, types of content that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of open source content. Um, uh, merged in, into the course. There's also content that the two instructors have created themselves. Uh, we did some custom creation of content uh, and then also licensed uh, some content from a third party. Uh, the total student cost for this course is, is $30. So that's a, a very you know, good amount of savings, uh, up, you know, $170 uh, for, for versus the, the new book uh, for, that, for that class. Uh, and then lastly, just to um, give you give you some indication of the the schools that we're working with, uh, a sample of some of our uh, clients that we work with: uh, Purdue, Cal State, Texas A&M, uh, University of Queensland, uh, down in Australia. Uh, more than happy if anybody would want to talk to uh, faculty members that we're currently working with. Uh, more than happy to make some introductions there, so you can get a feel for. Uh, the professor's perspective of, of working with Skypack. All right, so so with that, uh, I wanted to leave you know, ample time for for questions. Um, so so with that, that's the the end of the formal presentation. More than happy to uh, you know talk through anything in more detail or any or, or address any questions that that may come up. Well, one of the things that uh, will be kind of difficult is that we had a change of time, so not everybody who registered was able to make it. So we don't have too many people today. Um, but if anybody does have questions, uh, you, you see both of their emails right there. And if you have any questions for me, as usual, uh, send them right to jeff.glon at usg.edu. Oh, okay. We have a question from James Wilkinson. How do these courses integrate into Brightspace, aka D2L? D2L, yes, absolutely. So there's, there's of course, different levels of, of integration, uh, and, and we really leave that open uh, to the faculty member how they want to integrate. Um, so so the, the simplest, uh, which is really no integration, is simply pointing students via the syllabus or, or a link uh, somewhere in Brightspace to skypack.com with instructions on how to get access to their content. Uh, the next level of, of integration is, is basically single sign-on, um, so that would add a Skypack button uh, into the tools on, on, on D2L, uh, in which case students go into D2L, access their, their course, um, and, and can see whatever other content or, or instructions you have in there for them. Uh, they'll also see a Skypack button. When they click that button, it will automatically launch 
uh, launch the Skypack tool, uh, and, and uh, beyond the first initial access point, they will no longer need to sign in. It will have that single sign-on capability. Uh, the next and, and highest level of integration is when we start passing back and forth information uh, between a D2L in this case and, and Skypack. So that could be roster information, it could be grade information, uh, if there's any graded activities that are taking place in Skypack. Uh, that's really the, the highest level. Um, so we, as, again, we leave it up to the professor uh, what works best for them. Uh, we, will, we will work with them to uh, in, incorporate uh, that whichever way they, they choose. Okay, I'm not, oh, okay, we've got, so is there an LTI for grade score to be reported back into D2L's grade book? Yes, so as we were, exactly, so we use the, the LTI framework. Um, so as we were um, you know, working with that professor to determine the, the structure and the, the outline and the flow of the course, uh, if they were wanting to do um, any graded elements within Skypack and wanted those to be passed back uh, into, into D2L, then we would, um, when we can make that, that LTI connection, uh, that information would then be transmitted uh, through that. Uh, and there's a lot of different uh, options. That usually requires that we work with the IT department uh, at the school. Uh, and there are a lot of different options for how that's handled, how often that information uh, is, is transferred. Is it a, is a push type of transfer? Is it a pull type of transfer? Uh, and, and, and how often that's happening. But those are all questions that would be uh, addressed based on the professor's uh, needs for that specific course. And thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Wilkerson. So we have a survey that I'd uh, like attendees to fill out. Uh, this lets us know how we did and what we can do to improve our uh, web events in the future at ALG. So I, it, the link is a little bit different on the screen than it is over here. It's because Google, when they shorten the link each time, it just changes it to a new thing. But both of these will work. Um, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to both Brady and Kristen for uh, showing off uh, Skypack. I think it's a really interesting both service and uh, software. So thank you so much. And thank you for, for the invitation. It was, it was a pleasure. Thanks for letting us share, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.